Please be seated. I've been reflecting on the creeds for some time this fall, the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed primarily, and I've been wondering about preaching a sermon on them, but always something else comes up. This week, nothing came up, so settle in, get yourselves comfortable, and if you want to check my language, you are more than welcome to open your prayer books to page 358, where you will find the Nicene Creed on Sundays and other major feasts there follows, all standing. You might not notice in the prayer book that little tiny print that if you're my age you have to wear special glasses to read. It's in italics. It used to be in red, and so they called it still do, call it rubrics, which means the red letters. You can read those words, and you notice that we're in church, that those words don't say. You are more than welcome to call it <laughs> So after the sermon each week, on every Sunday, we stand. And together we announce this distillation of the great story of Scripture that was crafted to assist we Christians in understanding and living into the triune God's creating, redeeming, and sanctifying project for all creation. Yet here we are, sitting in Cody, Wyoming, in 2022, and we know that we are at least three to five languages removed, dozens of cultures removed, and almost 1,800 actual years removed from the authors, their concerns, and their world. And so we still have this document hanging together that we say by the rubrics every Sunday. If you are sitting here this morning, you might be one of the many Christians who have told me they approach this basically in one of two ways. First, I hear Christians who just swallow it whole as the litmus test par excellence for our faith. I'm standing here, I'm sitting here in this church, this is what I believe. The other response is to hold our nose or hold our breath and say a bunch of things that we are not sure we actually believe. There's a third option that is chosen by many, though none of you sitting here this morning, and that is to get up and leave. Yet I believe that there are way more fruitful, I would say, manners to engage the creeds than these three options. If we were just to open a window and let in some possibilities. If you don't know, the first generation of Christians said their first creeds at baptism. It was a set of words to announce their commitment to the transformed life they were now entering. And it gave a direct outline and structure to their faith in for the rest of their lives. It was performative rather than a passive witness. And they said this, Jesus Christ is Lord. That's it. We claim and proclaim in our living that this Jesus, who lived and died and was raised, is the Messiah, the Christ, the Anointed One, the one we have waited so long and who will bring about God's promised reign of peace and justice and love. And it is He who is Lord. Lord doesn't mean that much to us these days other than sort of an ancient lords and ladies idea that we threw off in 1776. But for those early Christians, when they said Jesus is Lord, they were making a very firm faith commitment that could and would and did get them killed. They were saying, 
Jesus is our Lord, not Caesar. We are not ultimately loyal to the powers of this world. We are loyal to God in Christ, who has and is and ever will transform our lives. Well, of course, things don't stay simple, right? So that simple affirmation was soon merged with the brief summation of Jesus' life and death and resurrection and future promise. And then as the followers of Jesus in generations to come left that Semitic world of their origin for that Greek multi-religious sphere that was the ancient Mediterranean world, a more disciplined outline of how Jesus relates to God, the Creator, was needed, and then how both Jesus and God connect with this Holy Spirit of the risen Christ that the early community was experiencing in their midst, connected to everything. And so 400 years after Jesus' death, the dust finally settled on Nicaea and its subsequent councils of the church. And so now we perform that mystery of giving worth to God in these words. We believe. We do it together. We are not rugged individualists pulling up our faith by our own bootstraps. And together what we do is believe. The word pisteo in the original Greek form from pistis meant we trust. We trust with all that we are and all that we have. This was translated into Latin, credo, meaning to this I give my heart. And so the English sense of the word believe in this 21st century with a passive intellectual assent to something that science has seemed to rule out long ago is a really different thing than that which our Christian forebears proclaimed. What we do in those first two words, we believe, we do together as this community that is called to witness, we pledge our active commitment to this reality. And we make a vow in these words, we believe. Not unlike the vows we make in marriage. Things that are grown slowly, often obscurely, and come as the fruit of many years of experience. As those of you who have made marriage vows know, they are not an arbitrary act of will concluded once and for all on the day you were married. They grow. We believe in. We believe in vaccines, or we don't. We believe in ghosts, or we don't. But St. Augustine said this in is not like those other in. If we were to say, believe in God, Augustine continued, he would say that means believing God's communication to be trustworthy. But believing in God is a directional belief. To quote Augustine, he says, believing unto, it is believing unto love, believing unto delight, Believing unto a walk toward God and being incorporated amongst the limbs and members of God's body. As human beings, we are always setting our hearts somewhere. In the creed, we are called to set our hearts on God. Rather than towards something or someone or some things or some ones that we are more than likely to want to set our hearts on in our world today. The creed challenges us to set our hearts in the direction of the one. The one who creates and saves and loves and makes new. The Episcopal Collect says it this way. May our hearts Surely there be fixed where true joys are to be found. 
we believe in one. Well, we might take that one as a sort of monotheistic claim, especially coming as it does in that multi-religious Mediterranean world of the first few centuries. Understanding God in the midst of many gods. But actually, the original intent of that word one was not as an adjective, but as a verb. The God who wants. And if you are not accustomed to hearing wanting as a verb, I suggest you go read Julian of Norwich. The wanting of God is the comprehensive healing, one mate of all creation. And finally, God. We believe in one God. But which God? There are so many to choose from. In the ancient Mediterranean world, that was true. In our world today, that is true. There are many gods with capital and small g's. Even in the Old Testament, there was El, El Shaddai, El Elohim, Yahweh, Adonai, or Lord. Well, say the authors of the creed, let us explain. Do you remember Jesus and his life? Do you remember that called the great God beyond us? his daddy, when he taught us to pray. Abba, Father, in the Lord's Prayer. Remember, Jesus told the story of God, who is a father of prodigal love, welcoming back even the most undeserving son. And do you remember Jesus on the night before he died, as he struggled in the garden, knew that he had enough trust with this one God that he was able to cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Father. God is Father. Not some other source and power. God is a tender and nurturing parent. A mother holding a child at her breast, and a father teaching his child to ride her bike. Almighty. In Latin, we're given omnipotens for this word, omnipotent, omnipotent, or having the capacity to do all things. But in the original Greek, the word was pentocrator, or one who can do no other that exercise sovereign power with every breath that one takes, whose energy is kinetic, realized, functioning among us always, not simply potential and waiting. Creator, of all, from before all, until all, not simply once and for all, but always, out of the outflowing love of God's self. The relationships of love between the members of the Trinity are so overflowing in love that it could not be contained, but spills out always in more creation. All creation, created in beauty and harmony and order, visible and invisible, creatures and things that are not yet created, coming from God and at the end of their lives returning back into God's own self. All creation, caught up in God, indwelt, inhabited by the gift of God's being. And so ends section one of the Nicene Creed. At this point in my reflections, you're not yet agitating around, but I can tell you're wondering if this sermon is not better offered as an entire class rather than on one day, and you would be right. But I am hoping that I am opening the window of your imagination just a crack. And if you can see in these few words of that first article of the creed that there is so much more potential than we give it credit for, we might imagine that the rest contains even more. 
In section one, on which I've just reflected, God is named mysterious, universal, transcendent, but also moving into section two, God is one single point in space and time where the fullness of God somehow miraculously dwells in one human being. The good news of hope and healing and renewal in his life and his death, his resurrection, his ascension, and his return in the Holy Spirit to be with us always. In sections one and two, God is named mysterious, universal, transcendent, and also at one point in time and space. And yet more. Also, moving into section three, God is the life-giving love gift that creates, recreates, rescues, vivifies, and embeds individuals like you and me in communities of hope. The Nicene Creed, in my view, is not primarily or simply a doctrinal litmus test. Rather, it is a love song. It is a poem of hope. It is a sort of word finger to point us to an ever deeper reality of the real. It is an invitation to transforming relationship and to transformed life. To whom and to what do you give your 